started. I do, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, we got a text, Angie got a text this morning from Dana, who plays our piano. Uh, Tom, who plays the tuba, the bass, all of those things. Um, euphonium, thank you. Uh, went to the hospital this morning. He had very high blood pressure and his heart rate was up. And so they were concerned about that. They went to the ER. So I would just bring that to you as a point of prayer. He's a young man. And uh, I know you guys will pray faithfully for him, uh, Tom and Dana Fry. There's a lot. Uh, Becky was going to sing this morning as well, and Gemma is not feeling well. I don't know if it has to do with her surgery or anything. No, okay. But just pray for that family as well. There's just a lot going on with different people. And uh, our scripture reader was supposed to read, and she wasn't able to make it, so Elliot pinch hit it. And so we're just grateful. Uh, for God's faithfulness nonetheless. And so God handles it as, as right. So I'd like to just spend a minute praying with you and uh, get our hearts focused in on what we want to talk about this morning. Father, we're grateful for your kindnesses to us uh, that we can, at the point of salvation, come to you just as we are. And uh, whether we're wounded, we're broken, Lord, you heal us and uh, you restore us and we're thankful for that. Lord, these are things we could never do in and of ourselves. And we are in desperate need of your, of your touch uh, through Christ. And so we're thankful for the gospel and for the hope that we have in Christ. I thank you for this people, this, this group of believers that are gathering here this morning. And, and Lord, I pray for them. I love them and I pray for them that you would give each one of them ears to hear what it is they need to hear today. Uh, that your spirit would guide their thinking as we engage in the text. I pray that your spirit would guide my thinking too and fill me so that I might speak uh, not based on my thoughts but on yours. We thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the hope that we have. Uh, Lord, and that hope is a precious thing as we look at the world around us that is, is dying and in confusion and not seeking truth, Lord, I pray that your spirit would work through your people, that we might minister to the world around us so that they would hear the truth, respond, and become followers of Christ. Lord, help us to be faithful as your church. We do pray for Tom and for Dana in particular this morning, that you would protect him and heal him and bring him back to full strength. And for, all el for everyone else that's struggling with health, that couldn't be here for, for those reasons, Lord, we pray for them as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week I took the time to walk through Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, uh, verses that we quote every week. And uh, we remember from that text this important point, that God is able to do way beyond all that we can even conceive of in our minds and in our thinking. And the most exciting part about that passage is that God wants to accomplish great things, great and amazing things through you through His people, the power through you. Uh, that's awesome. It's an amazing concept that God desires to work through His people in such a profound way. Uh, I also talked to you about the vision that, that uh, I see and that we see for Allendale Baptist Church in 2022. And that vision is leadership development, developing godly leaders and having a process where over time, we are able to raise up more and more leaders within the context of the church so that we can have a, continue to have a robust leadership here. And if the Lord wills, as we plant other churches, those leaders can go and serve in those contexts as well. If we don't do anything about leadership development here, how in the world are we going to be able to plant churches there? And so we have to be very very intentional about this process. And so that's the vision that we have for this year. We want to become a church of effective leaders, in not just in church, but in all areas of life, especially in the context of church, but in all areas of life. So the theme or the vision for 2022 is lead like Jesus. And I think that's a good thing for us all. This is applicable 
to all of us and for all of us because we all have a circle of influence in which we lead. Whether it may be great or whether it may be small, we all have this and we need to do it in the same way that Jesus does it. So today and and next week, we're going to dig into this concept. So you can call it a two-week series, Lord willing. Uh, Today, I'm going to answer the question, why should we lead like Jesus? And then next Sunday, Pastor Tim will show us what it looks like when uh, when he deals with the idea of how we lead. So I'm dealing with the why today, why lead like Jesus, and Pastor Tim will deal with the how to lead like Jesus next week. So why in the world should we have such a focus on leadership development? I mean, kind of sounds corporate, kind of sounds non-spiritual. Is leadership development godly? Is it the right thing for for a Christ followers to pursue? And I submit to you this morning, as we walk through uh, at least my portion, uh, as I submit to you this morning that it is absolutely crucial for the Church of Christ to develop leaders so that she can perpetuate her existence and impact the world. Now, after all, that's exactly what Jesus did. He absolutely did that. For three plus years, Jesus taught. He lived among, he coached, he equipped his 12 to be the leaders in the yet-to-be-formed church. Jesus trained the 12 to be the kind of leaders that would, in fact, transform the world. And I would say to you today, I think he did a pretty good job. And with the guys that he dealt with, and as you read through the Gospels, and you can see even some of the frustrations that Jesus had when he says things like, are you, so, are you still so dull that you don't get this? I mean, that gives me a lot of hope, by the way, that uh, they, were, they were hanging with Jesus, and he said, you, are you still so dull? Because uh, I have dull moments. I don't know if you do, but uh, it gives me hope that Jesus uh, still invested in them, and he still invests in us. Ken Blanchard, in his book called Lead Like Jesus, gives some insight into the why question that we're asking today. He said, a tremendous benefit happens in the lives of people who lead like Jesus. Freedom. Jesus is the only one who offers a model of leadership that is built on freedom and complete security in Him and His power at work within us. While the world continues to throw solutions at us that are built on self-empowerment, self-reliance, competition, peer pressure, and performance Leading like Jesus frees us to reach heights of influence we never would have been able to reach on our own. When we are free from pride and fear, free to humbly accept feedback and admit our mistakes, and strong enough to overlook offenses and forgive the errors of others, we can lead people and help them reach their full potential. Try to imagine leaders who lead like Jesus, leaders who love those they influence so much that they help them get from where they are to where God would have them to go. Leaders who hold people accountable, encourage them daily, confront challenges, and bring authenticity, character, and integrity to every interaction. Leaders who want to guide others on the same path. Imagine, imagine a world full of those leaders. I would say, imagine a church full of those kinds of leaders. So my friends, it's the desire of the leadership of this church not only to be leaders, that lead like Jesus, but to develop leaders who lead like Jesus. And this, I I think, is a good goal. But why? Why should we put energy into this endeavor? Honestly, this is the question, uh, this is the question that I'm tasked with answering this week. And it leads to the main thought that I want to share with you is this, why should you lead like Jesus? It's a good question. Why should you lead like Jesus. Now, before I answer the question, I I want you to see a couple of sober warnings from Jesus in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 27, uh, things that leaders and potential leaders must understand well. So there's a couple of warnings we're going to look at before we actually get to the, the why question today. So look at the first warning. Leading like Jesus will cost you. Leading like Jesus will cost you. Uh, So many people want to lead, 
uh, and climb to the top of an organization only to realize, and for those of you that may be at the top of an organization, you certainly realize this, they finally arrive and the cost is greater than they ever realized, greater in many ways. Jesus gives a clear warning about this to a mom and her two sons in this passage. Now, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, it says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, him being Jesus, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your kingdom. Now, before you get too hard on this dear old mom, I want you to remember something. That her two boys were and are her future, and these two boys had just left the family business. Right? Look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Jesus, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So who can blame a mom for wanting some assurance that their, her boy's career move would include some level of security for her and her boys. Now, I'm surmising, certainly, uh, but that probably is going through her mind a little bit. I remember the day when Angie and I went over and told my mom and dad that I was leaving Prince Corporation, a wonderful job, a design engineering job. From my mom's perspective, I'd finally arrived. Uh, you know, I finally had a job worth bragging about from her perspective and, and uh, was finally making some money and all those things. And, and so I told her, hey, uh, the Lord's moved in my heart and uh, God's opened the door and I'm going to become a youth pastor. And she started crying and they were not tears of joy. Uh, She's like, you finally made something of yourself and now you're going to become a youth pastor for crying out loud? Uh, she got better in with that, but that was her initial response. And sometimes we, sometimes we think very uh, myopically and very pragmatically as opposed to godly. And uh, I've been guilty of that. I'm sure you has, have as well. So unfortunately, mom or her boys uh, didn't fully understand what they had gotten themselves into. They were thinking about greatness from the world's perspective. Jesus' perspective, on the other hand, is exactly opposite. In fact, they must have missed what Jesus uh, had to say about himself in just three verses prior. Look back up at verses 17 through 19. It says this, And Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and he took the twelve disciples aside, and on, on the way he said to them, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they will deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Now, multiple times we see Jesus straight up telling the disciples exactly what's going to happen, and you can understand why he says things to them like, are you still so dull that you don't get this? Because they just miss it. And here the mom and the sons of Zebedee missed it altogether. What does it mean to be a great leader from Jesus' perspective? That's what we have to understand today. To be great like Jesus means this, suffering and death. Suffering and death. Jesus, in his immutable fashion, again, sets them straight. I want you to take a look at verses 22 and 23. Jesus answered, do you, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. Jesus doesn't pull any punches here. 
He tells them straight up that that they don't understand the implications of their request. Their answer to his question indicates a lack of understanding. Their unbounding optimism about drinking the Lord's cup is curious, isn't it? Right? They don't even ask him what this mysterious cup is. Their hunger for prominence and position and mom's hunger for security overshadows their perception and they answer this profound question with little thought. With with much naive exuberance, they cavalierly respond, we are able. We might say that today, we got this. We got this. How bad could it be? Bring on the cup. What is this cup? It's the cup of suffering. It's the cup of suffering. The Lord will drink this cup as he hangs on the cross. And they too, they too will drink this cup as their lives take a direction they don't quite understand as of yet. But they will. They will clearly understand in due time. Jesus promises this reality to them. They will, in fact, drink the cup. There's no question about it from Jesus' perspective. What seat they will sit in, that's the Father's decision, and Jesus isn't going to get into that discussion with them or mom. But as disciples and future leaders in the church, they will drink the cup of suffering to the very last drop. They will. This cup will cost them dearly. They, more than they could possibly imagine at this point in their lives. In fact, as tradition tells us, these two men in particular uh, drank that cup to the dredges. James was beheaded at Jerusalem. John, uh, the beloved disciple, also the son of Zebedee, If you know anything about him, he was the only one of the disciples that didn't die by martyrdom, but he did. He was banished to Patmos for a season. He was boiled in oil, uh, tradition says. I don't know if you can get your mind around that, but because of his faith in Christ, he suffered great persecution. And to be clear, the cup of suffering wasn't solely reserved for the sons of thunder alone. Uh, The rest of the apostles, except for Judas, died as martyrs well as well andrew uh, he was uh, he died on a cross uh, james james uh, the less was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a club judas we know died uh, he hanged himself after be, being uh, betraying the lord thaddeus also called jude was shot to death with arrows matthew the levi the tax collector was crucified in alexandria Uh, Nathaniel was flayed alive. You know what that means. He was skinned alive. He was cut open and beheaded in Armenia. Peter, also Simon, called Simon, was crucified head downward on a cross in uh, Parisia uh, during the persecution of Nero. Philip was hanged against a pillar in Hierapolis, And Thomas the doubter, was run through the body with a lance in the East Indies. That's what tradition teaches us of these men who serve the Lord. By the way, there's a powerful apologetic uh, that says, some people say, oh, they were just keeping a secret. Uh, Not too many people I know that would, all of them, being spread out over many different areas, would keep that same secret when it came to actually physically losing their lives. Leadership, my friends, is difficult. Uh, This is demonstration of leadership within the context of following Christ. And so difficult, it may cost your life. There's more martyrs today than in history. People standing for Christ. And we have to understand, we have to understand that. Friends, the apostles would soon realize that leadership, the leadership that they were given by the Lord would cost them greatly. Now, to be clear, the cost was minimal in comparison to their reward. Can I just share a couple verses that might give you some hope? 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 14, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, 
as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You're going to praise God when His glory is revealed. You're going to say it was worth it all. Right? When we see Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it was written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, but what God has prepared for those who love Him. We may run into some tough stuff in this life, but I think God's going to take care of us. And it's going to be worth it. Leader, you will suffer for Christ. But the rewards you will be given will, will more than cover whatever loss you have suffered. So why should you lead like Jesus? First of all, we want to understand that leading like Jesus will cost you. It will cost you. But don't worry. Uh, God will more than make up for it. That's the first warning we want to look at. Now take a look at the second warning that he gives. Leading like Jesus will test you. It will test you. So Jesus' first warning is about persecution from outside. But you know what? We have a lot of potential trouble that comes from within our hearts as well, right? Our own hearts. This, this time Jesus warns them about the dangerous evil motives of their own hearts. And it's something that we have to struggle with as well. Now, see if you can see what I'm talking about in verses 24 through 27. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant of the two brothers. But Jesus called, to, called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So do you see, do you see the potential of the evil motive in the heart that Jesus is warning against? Do you see what it is? Superiority superiority. They wanted to be considered significant and powerful in the kingdom. They wanted to be recognized for their individual greatness. And to be honest, don't we all? I mean, there's a part of that in all of us that we struggle with. Christian leaders who have a superior mindset, hear me, are a menace to the ministry. Paul, in three of his letters, makes this mindset and the warning against it clear. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, For by grace, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let, let each not look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. And in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's not about superiority. Do you notice the response of the ten apostles? They were ticked at this conversation. You see that? The text says that they were indignant, which means they were feeling or showing annoyance at what was perceived as unfair treatment. They were indignant. They were angry. They were angry because these two did what the rest wanted to do. That's what I think. Angry because, because they, these two, beat them to the punch and asked Jesus what they were hoping for in the kingdom themselves. They were angry because they had their mom talk to Jesus. Really? Mom? You're sending mom after Jesus? Angry because the ten had the wrong spirit and mindset as well. That's why they were angry. Notice the leadership style of Jesus. What does he do? He calls the twelve together for a teaching huddle, if you will. And, and in this teaching huddle, Jesus does some comparing and contrasting. First, he reminds them about the leadership style of the Gentiles. Right? He says, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, 
and their great ones exercise authority over them. So you notice that in, the, in this particular verse, there's a, a, a comparison and a contrast, okay? He says, notice, uh, he says, uh, the Gentiles, there, there's a rhetorical thing here going on, and he says, the Gentiles rulers lord it over them, and then he builds on that and says the Gentile rulers who are a great exercise authority over them, right? So, so the point he's making is he's building an argument. He says this is how the Gentile rulers think. They lord it over them. They have authority over them. For those of you who care, this is called a chiasm, all right? And it's a building of an argument in a rhetorical sense. Greatness from the world's perspective means being, per, being superior to others and to work over them. This is how the world tends to work. Now, notice the comparison here in verses 26 and 27. It shall not be among you. Listen, I've got a different way for you. You want to be a leader? You want to be a leader that's a leader like me? I've got a different way for you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So greatness, and notice Jesus uses these two words. Greatness must be, you want greatness? You must be a servant. And that's the word diakonos, which is where we have our word deacon. So you, want to be a, you, you need to be a servant. So we're all diakonos. We're all to be deacons in that sense. If you want greatness, that's what greatness looks like. It must, you must be a servant. And then he says, increasing the opposite comparison, he says, first among you, you must be your slave. Doulos, that word means slave or bondservant. Can I ask you a question? This is a hard one for us to wrestle with. What rights do slaves have? I'm not arguing for slavery. I'm asking the question. What rights do slave ha slaves have? None. We are slaves to righteousness. We are slaves to Christ. And we are slaves to one another. We are servants to one another. God's world and our world are not the same. I would suggest to you this morning that God's world and our world are diametrically opposed. And I can prove that from the Scriptures. This is why what we perceive as normal is not God's normal. And God's normal, in this case, is not greatness by subjugation. No, it's greatness by servitude. We are to be great by serving one another. That's how we exercise and demonstrate greatness. And they are failing the test of character that they have been given. So do you want greatness or do you want God recognized as great? That's the question you have to wrestle with today. We're talking about this in our spiritual gifts class and in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. Do you know what's going on in chapters 12, 13, and 14? There's a bunch of fussing going on in the church because everyone wants the spectacular gifts. They want those gifts that are going to bring them recognition. The gifts of healing, the gifts of miracles, the gifts of prophecy, these, these spectacular things that people look at, oh, wow, look at that, they're amazing. I wish I could be like that. So everybody's lusting after these gifts and forsaking the more significant gifts that Paul argues for, service, helps, those things that are behind the scenes that you get no recognition for whatsoever. God says through Paul that those gifts are even more significant than the dude up front talking. God humbles me every so often because when I read the Old Testament, I'm recognizing that in the Old Testament there's a story about Balaam. And God spoke through a donkey. He doesn't need me. He can speak through a donkey. But we need to revel in the fact that we all are gifted in particular ways. And the point that I'm making here is they were fussing at each other about that. And Paul said, enough. 
That is not, that is not the spirit that we are to have with one another. I think it's good counsel. So let me ask you, what kind of spirit, what kind of approach do you have when it comes to leadership? What kind of, what kind of leaders should we be producing here? Uh, ultimately, God produces them. But what kind of leaders should we be producing here as a church? I mean, we all lead in some fashion, by the way, We're at home. We all have a circle of influence in which we, we lead, home, family, church, job, wherever. Are you all about the power? Do what I tell you and don't question me about it. No questions asked. Are you about the prestige? I'm finally a manager at work and, and at last I get the recognition I deserve. Are you all about the position? Yep, I'm an elder at the church now. Right? That's the mentality and the motive of the world's system. That's the world's normal. But, but that's not God's normal. God's normal is humility. Years ago, I'll share this with you, years ago I was part of a music trio. And so I was singing in this music trio. I was, I was the tenor part in that music trio. And then as time went on, I was no longer part of that trio. No one ever talked to me or anything like that. It's just I was no longer part of that trio. And another person was inserted into that trio. And I would love to tell you I had the right spirit about it. I had to wrestle through that. And God had to, God had to use that in my life to the place where I came to saying, wow, this was a good decision. Because that other person that went in was actually better than me. And it made sense. And so, while I didn't like how it was handled necessarily, I praise God for that. See, but that didn't happen right out of the box, folks. Not at all. It was a test for me. A providential test from God for me. And initially a test that I didn't do so well at. But eventually, God changed my heart. That's what he does. That's what God does. He changes our hearts to be more like his. And, and, and he does this through the agency of his Holy Spirit and his Holy Word. And God, God used this verse to help my heart change, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. God used that verse, and he continues to use that verse I need to assess myself with sober judgment and I need to be careful about how I handle myself. So what kind of pride and superiority are you struggling with today? God wants to change your heart. That's what he does. That's the business he's in. He wants to change your heart. Will you pass the test? I, I hope, I hope you will. But you know what? There's hope. Even if you're not passing the test right now, pray that God would help you to pass and he'll get you there. He will. So, why should we lead like Jesus? Leading like Jesus will cost you. It's going to test you. It's going to test the motive of your heart. And the beautiful thing about God's tests are they are designed to make you more like Jesus. So, you keep getting them until you grow past them. At least that's been my experience. And what, what is the greatest goal for every follower of Jesus? What is our greatest goal? Obviously, to bring glory to God. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. But what's our greatest goal other than that? Is to be like Jesus. That's God's goal for you, is to be like Jesus in every aspect. And this, this is the why. We're getting to the why now. This is the why for leadership development. Number three, leading like Jesus will make you like Jesus. Jesus. Leading like Jesus will make you like Jesus. Again, this is our why. This is this when it comes to leadership development, we want we want to develop Christ-like leaders so that their leadership will perpetuate Christ. We don't want to develop leadership like the world develops leadership. 
We want, a, we want Christ-like leadership. Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus lands the plane here. He says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is our why, my friends. This is our why. And it should be the why for all of us who are followers of Christ. This should be the motive for all believers when it comes to their Christian life and their leadership opportunities, whether it's in church or wherever. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. By the way, that title, Son of Man, is given in in the book of Daniel, and it's reference to Messiah. And, and, and this Son of Man came for a particular ra- reason. This Messiah, which also means king, doesn't, he doesn't act like a king, at least like an earthly king, right? I mean, I, I look at, uh, I look at uh, England and the Queen of England and all the pomp and circumstance and all this stuff. And, you know, I mean, I heard, and maybe this is a vicious rumor, and it's, this is going out over the air, so maybe the Queen will send somebody for me, I don't know. But I heard when she made a trip over to America, even the toilet seats that she were to use had, a, had to have a special fur-lined covering. What? <laughs> That's weird. But our king, our king was born in a feeding trough. Our king had no place to lay his head. Our king was a servant to all. I think that's powerful. It's poignant. This Messiah king doesn't act like an earthly king. In fact, the purpose, it was the purpose and the drive of his life to be a servant. And we will do well as followers of Christ through the power of Christ to emulate Christ in this area. We would, we do. What do we need to emulate? Well, the text tells us, Jesus said it, he came not to be served. Now, let, let's just stop there and think about this for a minute. Jesus didn't have the butler mentality. Get this for me. Grab that for me. Serve me. That was not his mentality. That was not his spirit. And by the way, of anyone to have ever existed over the course of earth's history, wouldn't he be the one to be able to say those things? Absolutely. But this was not his goal. He came not to be served, but to serve. This, from our perspective, is so against our visceral nature that we tend to think it's a little bit crazy, a little bit insane. I mean, the king of all is a servant. I mean, that's what this text is. This is what Jesus is telling us. What does his service look like? He fed the hungry, right? He actually had compassion. When you read that story of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, those times, he actually had compassion on them. He was worried or concerned about them. He fed the hungry. He heals the lame, the blind, the deaf, and those who cannot speak. This, this was his spirit. This was his heart. He healed those with diseases. Think about this. People, when, when you had leprosy in that time frame, you, you were banished from the community, right? You could not live with your family. You could not be near your friends. You had to wear bells on your, on your robes, and you had to yell out, unclean, 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 so that people would stay away from you. There was no physical contact. But what, yet, when you read the story of Jesus healing the leper, he touched the first touch that that leper had had for perhaps years was the healing touch of Jesus. By the way, did Jesus need to touch him? He could have just, we know that he healed people from afar, don't we? The centurion servant and so forth. But he touched him, and that guy was healed. He had compassion on people. He was concerned about people. He healed those people with diseases. He frees people from demonic spirits. You see that over and over again in in the Gospels. He raises the dead. I mean, come on, people. That's amazing. And as impressive as all this is, he does something even better. He gave his life as a ransom for many. That had, those other things I mentioned had Temporal impact in a geographical location. Giving his life as a ransom for many 
has global impact throughout time. Ransom, the word ransom means a price paid for uh, redeeming captivities, loosing them from their bonds and setting them at liberty. So physically, that, that literally what it means. In, Mar- in Matthew and in Mark, it applies to the spirit, spiritually to the ransom paid by Christ for the delivering of men from the bondage of sin and death. There's a spiritual implication here. So he paid a ransom for us. And, and the word many, it means a great or a large multitude. And so uh, Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Romans 5.15 it says, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, so much, uh, so much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man in Jesus Christ abounded for many. Jesus served the many by offering up his single life for all. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the gospel. This is the reality that, this is why I trust that you're here today to celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you are born again and that as believers of Jesus Christ we come together and we worship him together because of his great work that he ransomed us from eternal condemnation because, because of his shed blood on the cross. Right? This is why we're here. I trust. He served you by giving you his life in exchange for yours so that we could be part of the many. Are you part of the many? I hope you're part of the many. Paul reiterates this truth to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. How did he accomplish this? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. That's how he accomplished this. It wasn't, he didn't buy your way into heaven with silver or gold. He purchased your freedom through the shed blood of Christ. And God the Father said, that's sufficient. That is sufficient to do that. 2 Corinthians 5.21, probably my favorite verse in the Bible. You probably hear it from me all the time. And I'm okay with that. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. He did that for the many. Why did he do this? Well, Titus 2.14 tells us, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. It's not just that he wanted to save you and to give you a home in heaven, but according to Titus, he saved you to do something for good works. He didn't save us to be pew sitters. He saved us to be servants of the Most High God. And when we are servants of the Most High God, we bring him much glory. Right? That's, that's what we do. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the mantra of every legitimate follower of Jesus Christ. I no longer live. I don't matter in that sense. But he lives in and through me. So please, please, by God's grace, if you have not done this, respond to his good news so that you can be part of the many. He's welcoming you in. And by faith, as you repent of your sins, you can be part of the many that Jesus is talking about here. Romans 10, 9, but if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what's the promise? You'll be saved. Are you saved? I hope you are. I hope you are. I, I pray that you are. 
And if you're not, I would just ask the question, what is keeping you from being the very person that God desires for you to be? That's what he, he wants you to be saved today. He wants you. And perhaps the Spirit of God's working on you right now. Don't, don't, don't mess with that. Submit to that. Submit to his call on your life. For those here who are Christians, your life is not your own. It's not your own. You've, you have the glorious privilege to give your life just like Christ did. Right? Jesus' life, from, human, from a human perspective, in fact, Isaiah even talks about this, Jesus' life from a human perspective was not spectacular. Being a leader means you are a servant, period. In God's terminology, you know, we talked about this from the beginning. Ooh, should we talk about leadership? That sounds so corporate. When you understand your terms based on what God has to say in his word, being a leader means you are a servant, period. A rider on horseback many years ago came upon a squad of soldiers who were trying to move a heavy piece of uh, timber, a, a tree, and the corporal stood by giving his, his orders in a very lordly fashion, heave! But the piece of timber was, was just a bit too heavy for the squad to move. Well, why don't you help them? asked a quiet man on a horse, addressing the very important corporal. Me? Why, I'm a corporal. I'm a corporal, sir. Well, dismounting from his horse, the stranger took his place with the rest of the soldiers, and he said, now all together, boys, heave. And that big piece of lumber, that big piece of timber, slid right into place. And then the stranger mounted his horse and addressed the corporal, and he said this, the next time you have a piece of timber for your men to handle, corporal, Send for the commander-in-chief. The horseman was George Washington, the first American president. George Washington is a great example of leadership here. But do you know who is the best example of servant leadership? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the best example of servant leadership. Leadership, And I challenge you to study the life of Jesus and see what an amazing leader he was and still is. I mean, has anyone, I mean, anyone had a bigger impact on this world than Jesus Christ? No one. Bar none. Save none. And, and not only, so, so not only should Christ be your Savior but he should be your profound example of servant leadership. How dare us exalt ourselves like this corporal did when our very Savior went to the cross for our redemption. We can never in leadership function in that capacity. That doesn't mean we don't do hard things. That doesn't mean we don't say hard things, but we do it with a spirit of servitude. So he should be our savior and our example of leadership because by doing so, you will become more and more like him. And that is a very good reason why we as a church should focus on leading like Jesus. We should. Now remember, remember, it's going to cost you. It's going to test you. It's going to test your motive of your own heart but it will make you like Jesus Christ. So in 2022, will you prayerfully put yourself in the way of growth by learning to lead your circle of influence, whatever that might be? Maybe it's your little kiddos at home. Maybe it's the corporation that you're leading. I don't know. Maybe as an elder in the church or, or a deacon or, or, or a children's worker, whatever, that little circle of influence, will you please purpose prayerfully to lead like Jesus. And if you do, if you do, don't be surprised at the amazing opportunities God will give you as you grow in Him. Remember what Blanchard said at the beginning when we talked about it. He says, a tremendous benefit happens in the lives of people who lead like Jesus. Freedom. Jesus is the only one who offers a model of leadership that is built on freedom and complete security in Him. His power at work within us 
While the world continues to throw solutions at us that are built on self-empowerment, self-reliance, competition, peer pressure, and performance, leading like Jesus frees us to reach the heights of influence that we never would be able to reach on our own. When we are free from pride and fear and free to humbly accept feedback and admit our mistakes and and strong enough to overlook offenses and forgive the errors of others, we can lead people and help them reach their full potential. This, in part, is why we exist as a church in Allendale, to help people reach their full potential. And that potential is only realized when they start and grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be challenged by the words of Jesus Christ. Lord, Christ is amazing. If there was anyone on the planet that deserved to be served, it was Jesus. And yet his attitude was not to be served, but to serve. So God, protect us. Help us to realize that, that it will it will potentially cost us and it will definitely test us as we pursue leadership but there's no better tool in your toolbox to make us more like Jesus as we purpose to serve like Jesus and it's in his name we pray amen